My sermon title today is Discovering Restoration. Discovering Restoration. How I got this sermon title was interesting because restoration is a really vast topic, right? It's a real, it's real wide, especially from God's point of view. It's funny because right before I came up here, um, Eric was trying to get this very visual ready for me and because um, I couldn't find one and he's really good at finding stuff. And I was look, we were looking through different things on Google and Google had like a restoration process that the world uses. And it's like this out, this thing that used to be fresh that was dated, got some rust on it because of the thousands of years that it's been in existence or what have you, some art painting or some sculpture. And then some, someone who's specialized in bringing all the hues, all the beauty from this art piece comes in and completely restores it as if it was brand new. And that's God's restoration process with us. God's restoration process looks just like that, but it has nothing to do with our age. It has nothing to do with, per se, how long we've been into something time-wise. It has everything to do with how much we're tapping into who we truly are. Now, God has placed something inside of every last one of us. He's given us unique character. And that's important because when we think through, that should, make, that should first off make us be in awe because there have been millions and billions of people on this earth and each one of them have been unique. Each one of them God has crafted individually for a specific purpose. And they've been on this earth to do something that according to God's plan they fulfilled. So when I think about myself and what God has put in me, I think about my own personal wiring and I'm wondering if, I've, if I'm always maximizing what God's put inside of me. Or if sometimes I need some restoration myself. Even as a Christian, you know, saved about 10 years now and went to Bible college, you know, got all this good knowledge. I wonder if I still qualify for that. And I think I do. Because there's times that I'm not fully living in the image that God has put inside of me. And that's what needs to be restored a lot. Not just my looks or find if I'm rusty, which I really am right now. I need to shape up. It's not just things like that. And we're talking about things that God has put inside of me that I'm not fulfilling. So if he's called me to be a garbage man, if he called me to faithfully, diligently every day, pack garbage, put the garbage in the truck, load it up, go down the street. If he's called me to do that every day, but I decide to be a king, I'm not living in my process, right? I need to be restored. It's not about elevation where I am by the world's eyes. It's about what God calls me to be. And if I'm not living what God calls me to be, even if I am a king, I am See, I am below what God has called me to be because if I was called to be a garbage man. If I was supposed to be a garbage man, but I'm living as a king, I'm backwards and I'm living below my calling. You guys following me? I'm not, I'm not living in, in stride for what God has called me to do. So this is, this is the context I put restoration. This is how I defined it. Um, through looking through different stories in the Bible, like Jonah, who needed to be restored. He was off track. He needed to be brought back. David, who fell in sin. And he needed to be brought back. Different levels of just disobedience or not fulfilling God's, God's calling. This is the definition that I came through, just kind of thinking with God. Restoration is trusting God with providing clarity to our soul's identity with the gift that he gives us by making us look like him despite us. I'm going to read that again. That's kind of long. <laughs> God, the God's version of restoration is us trusting God with providing clarity to our soul's identity with the gift he gives us by making us look more like him despite us. Again, like I said, we have a unique character from God, and all of us need to get connected to exactly what that is in order to properly walk in that, right? We're not going to be confidently or properly walking in what God has given us to do if we don't even know what that is. Before I even get too ahead of myself, and jump into that specific part that I want to get into. I'm going to connect restoration and rest. Um, yesterday, I'm just going to do this from this angle. Yesterday, right, yesterday. Um, we were at a leadership meeting, a couple of the leaders in the church. We were just talking about what God has done this year, the beautiful work that God has done in our souls because rest has been the theme. And we've all just been resting in different ways. God has given us rest with, with, uh, in different contexts and Creativity. We were just sharing how, how that's been for us and getting, kind of getting inspired, and it was really dope. And Eric said something that really articulated something that I was trying to work on. Yesterday at the leadership meeting, I was still working on my sermon, and he articulated something that really brought light to something that I was trying to say. 
The, re- the way that restoration and rest are connected is when we bridge the gap between who we think we are and who we actually are. So when God gives us our rules and God says, this is what I've told you to do, but we decide to do something else, we're not resting. We're, we're doing all these other things and burning ourselves out because we're, we're looking in front of our eyes at what we think needs to be done instead of going to God and saying, Zach, what, what have you told me to do? And let me rest in that because if I, if I channel my strength inside of what you told me to do and only function in what God has told me to do, then I shouldn't be burnt out doing all these other things and I won't find myself running around and finding X, Y, and Z things to do that look like they need to be done and need my attention when God hasn't really called me to that. So restoration, we get restored back to our original identity when we're actually walking in line with what God has called us to do. You guys follow me? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Hope so. Don't just say yes to, I'll, I'll repeat it. I mean, don't, don't just say yes to appease me now. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. If you don't have your Bibles, it's going to be on the screen. Um, up until this point in 1 Corinthians, Paul has, well, 1 Corinthians gets like a lot of spiritual backhandedness from Paul. Not in a bad way. This is kind of a lot of correction needed to be done in that church. Um, a lot, they were living outside of what God has called them to be. And Paul was helping them get restored back to that. Um, the chapter before this, just to give you some context, Paul was addressing the fact that people were in that church and they weren't seeing him correctly. They were seeing him as this elevated, oh, good, yo. So people were bragging like, Paul baptized me. I got baptized by Paul. What's up? And other dude was like, well, I got baptized by Apollos. And there was like these two gangs looking at each other, Paul and Apollos, when they were really just servants of God. So transitioning to this chapter, he says, This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. I love that. I just, isn't that so, oh, isn't that just so dope, the way he articulated that? Stewards of the mystery of God and servants. So Paul is like, I I know my calling, and anyone could call me what they want to call me. People could define me how they want to define me, but that doesn't really matter to me, because God has given me two missions. He's called me to serve, And he's called me to steward his mysteries. So if anyone says that I'm something that I'm not, that doesn't matter. Because God has given me an identity already, right? No one can take me away from this anchoring, this grounding that I have. Because if God gives me an identity, who are you to tell me who was not even my maker that I'm supposed to be doing something else? Even if it seems like it's something that's flattering. And it's easy for us to get flattered and be like, oh, God, stop. (laughs) We keep going, keep going. And they're flattering Paul. And he's like, I won't even take your flattery because your flattery is even below what my calling is. Don't flatter me and say, oh, I'm this great dude who baptizes people and I should be above Apollo. Forget that. I'm a servant and I'm a steward of God's mysteries. So when we find that identity that Paul did, we get a little bold about who we are. We get a little chip on our shoulder. No one can tell us that we're something that we're not. No one can come up to us and dare try to redefine what God has already given definition to I dare you to. I dare you to walk around with that boldness, that chip on your shoulder, and say, this is who I am. Despite what negative, positive someone says about me, if it doesn't fit this criteria, I'm not accepting it. Keep your flattery. No thanks. I'm good the way I am. Paul (coughs) also does something that I find pretty interesting. Um, He has good priority by giving this list of two. He has really good priority. And I remember listening to a sermon and hearing him talk about how he asked God for just very simple bullet points for what God has called him to do. And um, I asked God for that. I'm like, man, that's really cool. Let me, let me like, check, try that out. And that's, it, was, it was crazy. As soon as I asked God, okay, give me priority about what I, should ha- what, sh- what I should orchestrate in my life. How I should have my life organized. He responded immediately. You know those times where it's just like, you kind of say it and expect that, like, uh, that P.S. I'll get back to you sometime down the road. But he, like, responded like that. And he said, Sandy... Reading and writing. Boom. And I was like, hold up. That's it? What about my friends? And Sandy, reading and writing. Well, what about like, I preach and what you feel? Sandy, reading and writing. And that's all the memo that I need. Because I didn't realize at the time that it was scary. Because I was like, what about all these other things that I have to do? What about all these other things that I'm responsible for. Am I only supposed to be in this bubble with my wife, a book, and a notepad? Like, 
I don't, I don't get it. Like, what is, how do I influence? I, I'm called to people. How do I end up getting there? But what I didn't realize is the more that I, I spend time with Sandy, the more my heart stays tender towards other people. The more that the bubbly, lovable, worship, power, powerhouse that you know her to be influences my life, the more powerful I become. And then I also realized that the more I read, the more my mind gets open. So the more relatable I am, the more I can influence other people and talk to other people. The more I write, the more creative I get. So then the more I could write sermons that influence people and I get, but God wasn't stupid when he said, Sandy, reading and writing. He intentionally gave me a, a, a list, a memo to follow for a reason. And I, I dare you to ask God for that. I dare you to ask God for a priority list. What do I need to prioritize? Not what looks like it needs priority from me. Because things will demand attention from you all the time. I'm asking you to ask God, what are some things that you need me to prioritize? And you might be shocked by how he responds. Let's keep walking. <sighs> restore, being restored has a few different meanings. Um, I feel like God was saying a lot to me throughout worship, so I might skip over some of this because it's something I really want to get to. But again, um, we're being restored to God's image. Uh, I want to go through some scriptures that kind of justifies and buffers that a little bit. Jeremiah 10, 23. So Jeremiah 10, 23 says, a man's way is not in himself. Uh, that is, I'm sorry, nor, nor is it in a man to direct his steps, which kind of slap in our face to like the whole plan your life out, be happy, die, you know what I'm saying, one day. That kind of spits in our face because we think that we're just in charge of our whole lives. Jeremiah 10, 23, a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man to direct his own steps. So I think it's easier to just let, let God be in charge of our lives for a little bit. Psalms 100, verse 3. One of my favorite scriptures um, that I, I quote to myself a lot. One, because I, li I like the way it's worded. Um, I'm a poet. You know, I'm, I pay attention to how things are, are articulated. But also because it, put, it keeps me in perspective. Um, it says, it's he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And we have no right to dictate the outcome and the direction of our lives because we didn't create ourselves. So we don't fully know what God has done when he made us. We're in, the, we're in this house. We're in this body. We're living these lives. And it's very easy to think because, hey, I'm me. I got me under control. But reality is you don't, you don't fully know why you're created and why God made you, who God wants you to touch. It will surprise you. I dare you to ask God. Give him insight into your life. Ask him, let him speak in the specific things that are going on. It will surprise you what God has called you to, despite how you think you're wired or how you think your experiences disqualify you from things. You might be surprised by how, what God actually uses you to do. You might be surprised by what, God, what lanes God puts you in, that you felt, felt like, I would have never done that thing. I would have never stepped in this thing. Being restored not only means that God has created us and we don't have a right over our own lives and the, and the destination or the destination or origin of our lives, but it means that God will bring us back to our origin. Um, I love the fact that people are complex because I look at people a lot and it's easy to look at an action that someone does. It's easy to look at a sound bite that someone gives you and just judge it and be like, oh, that's that's why that thing is going on. I, I, I see discernment. You put them discernment eyes on. Be like, mm, I see what you're doing. Yeah, this is why that's going on. But really, we have no idea. People are so much more complex than what we see. Like We have perspective. We might have certain perspective on people's lives that they might not have. But people have been living and doing so much outside of from what we see. And I, I have to constantly humble myself with that because I think I have discernment. And I'll see someone do that. And me and my social work degree, I'll be like, mm, you're dealing with that. Have a good day. And I think that because the knowledge that I obtain, it, it gives me the right or the license to speak into someone's life. Reality um, is I, I don't know the history of people. People have a history aside from me. Everybody does. We all have a physical history, an emotional history, and we're all tied to the same spiritual history. But there's just things that I don't know that people go through that I have to really be humble about when it comes to trying to interpret people's lives or come with this like large amount of wisdom to speak into people. And even my own life, when I try to give certain perspective in light of things, but without God, 
I find myself getting frustrated because I don't know everything. And there's a lot of things I also forget about my own life. Like, my sisters will come up to me and say, hey, you remember the thing happened? And I'll be like, I was too young, or I'm just too dumb to recall it. Like, I, I have a limited capacity. So trying to draw objective conclusions to things is foolish. I have, oh my goodness, I, that's, that's why, before I even go there, that's why when Job was so frustrated with God, and Job sat down with God and called himself righteous, said, I didn't do anything to deserve this, why, and so on and so forth, are you doing all these things to me? What did God do? God showed up and brought him to the past. It's so interesting that God didn't even respond to him, right? God didn't even say, oh, this is why you're good. God never gave him an answer why he went through what he went through. All God did was bring him back, give him a little history lesson. Oh, you, you want to question me about why I decided to use your life this way? You want to question why I, I gave you this, tr- this trouble? You want to question why all these things are going on in your life? Okay. Were you there when I created the earth? Did you draw out the lines with me? Like, did you give me counsel when I was creating and crafting animals? And now you want to ask me about when a few thousand years later, something's going on in your life, one person out of the millions and billions of people that exist, you want to question me about that. You see how silly it is to go about things on our own wisdom, go about things on our own minds, when we have access to the wealth of wisdom and the wealth of strength that will hold us and carry, literally carry us through situations? It's silly. It's silly. Um, let me tell you a story, because what I thought restoration was before I started this process of writing the sermon was um, like the real big sins. You ever heard someone is getting restored because they fell into some unfortunate situation? But God reminded me of a story, something I forgot. Like I told you, my brain isn't all the way there sometimes. He reminded me of a story when I was in college and I needed to get restored. And I hope this gives you perspective about the expanse of restoration, because you can get rest. Excuse me. <laughs> you can need restoration from something super large or something really subtle. I won't even say small. I'll say not as loud. As as I mentioned, I went to a Bible school. Uh, I'm not going to drop the name of the Bible school because of the story I'm about to tell. But um, talk to me after. I went to Bible school. It was really awesome. I met some amazing friends there who became life brothers of mine. Um, one night. <clears throat> these life-giving, Christ, Christ-believing, Jesus, Bible-thumping believers decided to have a party. Um, it was a party outside of our dorms. One of our friends had an off-campus apartment that was about five minutes from the, about, about five-minute drive. I drove everybody everywhere because I was going with the car. The car still hold me down today. Shout out to my blue Honda. Um, and Back then, let's just say I was a little bit more legalistic. Let's just put it that way. I was a lot more like, the Bible says this. What are you doing doing that? God will judge you. Like, ask my friends. I was really, I was pretty rigid in college. God worked his grace into me slowly but surely. Um, And somebody bought drinks. Somebody bought a lot of beer. A lot of beer. Um, Now, I don't like beer, even to this day. I'm even more grace-filled Juanza. Well, not drink beer because I don't like the taste. But, um... There was beer there, and I drank none of it. I was too busy judging people with my discernment eyes. <laughs> and my friends were going in, and I was like, brothers. <laughs> brothers, we signed a covenant, because we did. Yeah, before you join the school, you signed a covenant that you won't do certain things that the school deems ungodly, and drinking was one of them, so I said, brothers. <laughs> we signed a covenant. What are you doing and I literally s- sat there for about two hours and watched them all get drunk out of their minds, like pretty bad. Well, one of my friends, <laughs> he holds his liquor pretty well, so he was just chilling, but the rest of them were pretty bad. And when my one friend gets like that, I've only seen him like that, that, that day in his wedding, he gets more irrational than he usually is, let's just say. And um, I started judging them to the point where I stopped caring about what happened to them. Um, I distanced myself mentally and just kind of closed myself off into a bubble um, and told myself, you know what, a lot of you have to drive home, but that's your business. A lot of you probably have to go back to your dorms where your RAs are going to be looking for you, but that's your business. I'm going to be over here, saved and sanctified. All right. And God checked me immediately as soon as I closed my heart off to being available to them. And he said this distinctly. He asked me, are you your brother's keeper? I 
I'm in Bible school, so I better answer that question right. <laughs> and it just convicted the mess out of me. Like I, couldn't, I can't begin to tell you how deeply I just repent, I repented in that moment. And I immediately got up and got all my friends together. Uh, one of my friends who demanded to drive home, who I couldn't stop, drove home. But I, made sure, I called and made sure he got there safe. I took everybody else's keys who just really couldn't drive. We all crashed at my friend's house that night, though we had class the next day. Um, not sure how they did in class. Can't remember. Again, my brain. Um, but yeah, it was, it was an experience. I remember, I'll never forget getting checked like that and needing to get restored to God in that moment because I, I thought myself too self-righteous to be there for my brothers. Though they were doing something wrong, there are going to be people who are doing something wrong and have, in your eyes, right, have every right to just be on that side of the line. They have every right to just be those people. But it is your right to have the restoration of God to behave like God, to step over that line to get in their face, to tell them the truth, but to love on them in those moments. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's someone in this room under the sound of my voice who needs to forgive someone who was wrong, but you still should have done a little bit extra to help them out. Because you being right or wrong isn't the case here. We were dead wrong. And what did Jesus still do? Being restored means behaving like our God who steps beyond the lines that we make about right and wrong. Steps beyond the lines that we try to create in our minds that gives us the right to be separate, to be other than someone else who was created in God's image. We never have that right. Never. Oh, man. My friends. <laughs> my friends. Gotta love them. <clears throat> um, I also realized that in that moment, I was putting people in boxes and I was labeling people that are far more complex, let's say again. Um, there is, in psychology, in, in, in my, uh, like I said, I got, a, I got a degree in Bible and social work. In my social work uh, classes, I learned a lot of interesting stuff about how to read people, about how people function, about how people with cognitive impairments have to do life and how difficult it is for them. And um, I learned something called the diagnostic approach. That approach was is actually a very popular approach in psychology and psychoanalysis. It essentially means that you sit down, if you're doing a counseling session with someone, as a psych psychologist or a clinician, and someone comes in, you don't know what they have yet, say they don't know what they're, they're coming in to get diagnosed with some kind of cognitive impairment. Um, and you, with all the wealth and knowledge that you have, you kind of just whiff the air, waft it a bit, see, see what this smells like, see what it's familiar with, and label them based off what it feels like. Not exactly doing the work of coming to conclusions subtly, but diagnosing them based off of your past. So your past experiences, give them a nice little label. Which gets messy, I wish Joe and Michelle could be preach this real quick, but which gets messy when we, when, when there's someone who would say depression and someone who has been repressing Thoughts because they have PTSD. Those people need to be handled carefully and differently. But when we label, when we label them and just say, ah, oh, depression, that gives a very concise and condensed answer that will probably end up ruining that person's life. Because they'll get medications that aren't accurate, they will get labeled, and they won't get the right care for the clinically that they need, and they won't have access to the right amount of resources that they need. They'll, they're in some ways similar, but they need very different kinds of attention. Lying joke, yes or no? Yes. I'm lying. No. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's, we have to be very careful with how we just come up with simple answers to something. Martin Luther King has a quote. It's my favorite story, if anyone knows. Um, he has a quote that I'm currently not seeing on my, on my iPad, so I think it's on my phone. I want to read it because I think it's really important. It says, rarely do we find men willing to close phones? My phone's not for closing my <laughs> Sorry. Rarely do we find men who willingly engage in hard and solid thinking. There's almost universal quest for easy answers and half big solutions. Nothing pains some people more than having to think. <laughs> Oh, he's such a beast. Uh, let me read that again. Where do we find men who willingly engage in hard style thinking? There is almost a universal quest for easy answers 
and half-baked solutions. No, you know Nothing pains some people more than having to do <sighs> Digging is one of the hardest things that we'll ever have to do, but it's the only way that we're going to find restoration. Digging and finding the true reasons why things happen in our lives, not just labeling certain things in our past as bad or good or comfortable or inconvenient, because God works in the midst of those things that we call bad, good, and we label. But if, if we just have a certain instance in our, in our past that happened to us, right? A certain thing from our past that, that occurred, we just label it as bad and untouchable. We will lose out on the heart of God. We will lose out on the work that God does when he comes in the trenches with us and works on issues. Because I came to the conclusion that God can restore situations that we call bad. God can touch those areas in our lives that we think make us untouchable. God can use situations that we have just thrown away and said, you know what, I can't, I can't, no one can really see this. If someone gets to find this out, no one's going to like me. If people hear about what I did back in the day or what I'm doing right now, I couldn't even sit in front of these people in the church. God works in the midst of that. God isn't afraid. God isn't afraid of your situations. I love that, song, that new song we just sang today. It says, bring your fears and doubts. Bring your pains. Bring your mistakes. Bring the things that are all your fault. I'm not scared of those things. I want to intimately work with you in those things, as a matter of fact. Don't think that anything disqualifies you from God's love. Don't think that anything disqualifies God from being able to blow the dust off of your identity and restore the identity of his image inside of you. There's nothing in this earth that can do that. There's nothing in this earth that God cannot dig down deep into and pull someone out of. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. And I think because, in my, in my, at least in my personal life, there are far too many times where I gave the world the Google Translate for my pain. I gave the world the, the interpretation for something I went through. And I allowed the world to tell me what that meant. And um, if I could take some creative liberty, right, and talk about, like, David. David, who was anointed as king and then was hunted down by the person who had the seat that he, he was supposed to have. Makes a lot of sense, right? If I could talk about Joseph, who was given a dream that he was going to be exalted, might not have went about, about, about the best way of explaining it to his brothers, but then was being kidnapped and thrown into slavery by his brothers. I'm sure that made a whole lot of sense to him in the time, right? If you just froze him in time, how do you think he would label that? Abraham, who was nice, comfy, cozy, right where he was, and God told him to pack up and just walk. Walk where? Just walk. For miles. Freeze him in the midst of his, of his, of his journey. You think that made sense to him? You think he had, like, the, the proper interpretation? His belief is real. Their belief is really what carried them all the way, but... You think that in that moment that they had the proper label for that? It's their belief that connected them to God to, that allowed them to even make it as far as they made it. And I would encourage you guys to continue to have the faith. Don't lose the faith because what you're in right now doesn't make sense. God is always in the process of restoring things. Things that he might not have had anything to do with as far as the things that you've experienced. But he's in the process of bringing back his image inside of you. Despite what you've done, what's been done to you or what you're doing. He will never let you go. And if anything in your life ever makes you say these three words, God left me, you know it's the enemy. You know it's because he's in the business of getting you to say those three words. God's left me. Um, God blessed me. <laughs> I have... Since the last time I preached, wow, since the last time I preached, I've been promoted to a full-time position working at a K-8 after-school program. I used to work for a high school program. Um, and I've gotten promoted to the K-8 program, which has been difficult is a euphemism. It's, a, it's an understatement. I'm being humble by saying it's been difficult. I found my niche, I felt like, with high schoolers. Like, give me any high schooler, rough or not rough. Like, and I'll, I'll give them back to you a little bit better, even if it's only a little bit. <laughs> 
and now I'm dealing with kindergarten through eighth grade? Like, oh my goodness, like, what? Like, I never in my life thought that I'd be doing this. Only, only, literally, only God taking my life and navigating me there. I would have never thought I'd be doing this. And if you knew me, uh, especially before this, you know I thought I was really comfortable where I was. Uh, to say the least, uh, especially the younger kids, about K-3, they're a little difficult. They're a little difficult. Um, a lot of times, uh, I mean, anyone can do something that confuses you, but five five-year-olds, eight-year-olds, like, I just want to pick them up sometimes, like, what, what are you thinking? What, what are you doing? Why would you do that? I can't give specific stories, but there's this, there's a kid, like, four different times, like, jumping off stuff and kicking people in the face, like, but you're not a martial artist. What are you doing? I have to remember constantly this, something that my professor, one of my professors told me in college, that if you knew everything that there was to know about someone, you would understand everything that they did. If you knew everything there was to know about someone, you would understand everything that they did, even at that age, right? I think far too many times, at least me, I get into a comparison game. Like I'm behaving. Why can't you just behave? Like, you see me standing here, still, calm? Just want to copy-paste that onto your life real quick. But there's a history to everybody. People have reasons why they do what they do. People are fearfully and wonderfully made to be the way they are, as dysfunctional as they may seem to you or not. And what's, be, what's even the more tragic thing is people like me in the moments where I look at pe the kids and question what they're doing, don't have the patience to show them that who you are isn't a mistake, that who you are is an intentional craft handiwork from God. You're not, a, you're not, you're not, you're not just accidentally have a lot of energy. You don't just accidentally care about your friends when you want to share toys. You don't just accidentally have the heart that you have. God has fearfully and wonderfully made you. And when I, when I flow in that impatience, I find myself kicking myself because I know that God has created them for, an, for, for a specific reason. And what they're doing right now might be inconvenient to me. That doesn't mean that it's imperfect. That doesn't mean that what they're doing wasn't intentionally placed inside of them by God. There's a Jonathan McReynolds song. Um, Jonathan McReynolds is a really dope uh, gospel artist that my, my wife put me on to. <clears throat> and it's a song called Pressure. The lyrics, I'm not going to sing it. You guys don't got to worry. I'll spare you, but um, the words go, I need to rid myself of the pressure, pressure, pressure to be someone else that the world has made. Jesus, take from me all the pressure, pressure, pressure to be someone else you did not create. Then he has a bridge part. I just want to park after this line. He says, help me. Be me. I need your help to even function fully as myself. Because when I'm in this job and I see certain kids that are going off the wall, I know what you've called me to do. I know why I'm even here right now. I need your help to be myself. I need your help to function properly in the way that you created my mind to function. God, I need you to be Jawanza. And that sounds crazy. But all of us are incomplete in our own identities without God. All of us need that a nice little shine from him to be restored back to the image he's made us. We've copied and pasted too many things from the world onto us that we just thought looked good. We took far too many things from the world that looked good on the world. But when it goes on a son or daughter of God, it's just not fitting. It's like Saul's armor on David. We have to go in there with our own identity. We can't capture what we think just looks good. We can't take from the world just, oh, damn, that, that living room set, that, ooh, with that dress, that... That hairstyle. We have to be ourselves. Fearfully and wonderfully you were made. Be yourself. Don't cop whatever you think is cool or whatever the world got going on. Be you. Be you. Because of how God personally wired me, um, 
Oh, man, I'm going to try not to get emotional. Because, I got, because of how God has personally wired me, I have a heart for the world. And sometimes it's annoying to like have this, to care this much. <clears throat> sometimes I really just think I don't want to care because so many things, all the things that are going on in the world. And when I talk about restoration, I think about how broken the world is. I think about the mother that I saw on Instagram for the shooting in, Cal- in California that happened last week, whose son survived the Las Vegas shooting just to get shot in California. Like, I think about that and I think how desperately this world needs to be restored. And sometimes I can get frustrated because it's like, God, you see this and do something. You know, like, you gave me this heart, so I know your heart is bigger than mine for this. Why does this keep having to happen? I get weary. I get worn out. Sometimes I, I just, I hear about something and I just have to bow out of it because I get so emotionally invested. And I just can't, I sometimes don't have the energy. I'm very tempted sometimes to think that God is just passive. Passive God, it's like an oxymoron. <clears throat> And more than our nation's issues, I think about places like Africa that have levels of complex issues, above like poverty and water and clothing and some of the things that we're used to. There's something called a land grab in Africa. Land grabs happen um, when there's a family living in a village or by themselves um, who are a pretty traditional family. Father is the breadwinner. Mother um, feeds, take, feeds, the, feeds the children, takes care of the children, washes dishes and cooks and all, this, all the stuff that we're used to from traditional families. The father gets sick. Now, because certain areas of Africa don't have as much medicinal resources available to them, something as simple as a common cold can kill you. <laughs> Vaccinations don't exist. Like, Benadryl, Tylenol don't exist. Like, that's the luxuries that we have in plentiful here that are not available in Africa. So within weeks, though he takes it down from work for a while and tries not to do much, the father gets terminally ill, terminally Ill and dies. Without even days to mourn, the father and the husband of the family, there'll be a knock on the door. The wife will open the door with nobody around but a piece of paper. She'll pick up the piece of paper, and on it will read, if you do not give up your house, since you can't defend yourself now because your husband has died, if you do not give up your house, we will kill your children, rape you, destroy your house, in that order. And I'm baffled just to think about the, just, the injustice of that. Without even days to mourn their father, this child is being threatened of death. Can you imagine? Could you imagine? It's so easy for us to see things like that, hear things like that, and just be convinced that God doesn't care. To be convinced because there's such an overwhelming amount of it happening, because that's just one story and one tragedy of thousands in that country with that specific issue. It's easy for us to just, God, where's the justice? Restoration is a slow win, a win that we know is coming. Because we read the Bible, we know that God wins at the end of the day. And he even promises to bring justice, vindication to every person that has ever faced an injustice. He says, the battle is mine. Vindication is mine. 
Don't fight back. As much angry as it makes you, justice belongs to me. And he will, in some mysterious way that I can't even wrap my mind around right now, he will wipe every tear from every person who's ever faced an injustice and restore them as his beautiful child. Every single last one of them. I have a scripture that I want to give you guys in my closing. Revelations 21, verses 3 through 5. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither that shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Heaven is our eternal rest. We have to fight so much for rest because things on this earth aren't in their proper order. Heaven is when we will rest ultimately, finally, with no care, with no concern, with no tear, because God has wiped away all of them and done away with all of his enemies. Everything will be put, put, be put back into proper order where God reigns and everyone else says amen. <laughs> oh man, this isn't our home. If there is ever a time where either a situation, either a personal pain, a past pain, stops you from being restored back to God's image, back to how he wants you to function, do not lose the hope through the struggle. Don't lose the hope of God's promise to make everything new, to make everything right again, to never, ever have to deal with any of the things we see today any of the injustice, any of the pain, ever, ever again. Lord, I thank you so much for your word, your truth that gives us hope in the midst of heavy hearts and detrimental situations. I know you are close to us, God, because your Bible says so, even when it doesn't feel that way. Your word is a light to our path, God, and we need it always. Because we can't direct ourselves. We can't even correct ourselves without you. So God, bring us to the place. Bring us to the place where we have you and that's all we need. We have your identity that you've given us and that's all we need. Your character inside of us. Your hope inside of us. And that's all we need. Lord, bring us to the place where we have 100% confidence in you and our relationship in you. Help us see you how you are, so we can therefore see ourselves how we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord.